For starters, I would like to thank you for joining us for the first of many events ASEF has to offer regarding educational facilities. ASEF is a project funded by the United States Department of Education established to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to public early childhood, K-12, and higher education institutions. ASEF provides resources on facility planning, design, financing, construction, improvement, operation, and maintenance. We invite you to follow ASEF online at acefacilities.org and also encourage you to join the network of professionals already following the educational facilities discussions on Facebook, Blogger, and Twitter. At the conclusion of today's session, we will provide a list of upcoming events and we encourage you to visit the site for future updates as well. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you take this opportunity to learn more from the content presented, engage with the speaker, and add to your professional knowledge of vulnerability assessment. Hello, my name is Mark Littleton. I'm Project Director for the American Clearinghouse on Educational Facilities. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Arthur Cummins. Dr. Cummins is the Director of Safe and Healthy Schools for the Orange County Department of Education in Southern California. He oversees programming in the areas of health and wellness, sports and physical education, food and nutrition, drug and alcohol prevention, and mental health services. Previously, Dr. Cummins served as a classroom teacher and administrator in middle and high schools in Oklahoma, Texas, and California. Dr. Cummins also serves as the Southern California Lead for the School and Law Enforcement Partnership, which facilitates collaborative relationships between law enforcement agencies and school district personnel. In addition, he serves on a number of boards and advisory committees, most notably as the co-chair of the California Child Abduction Task Force. Again. It is my honor to present to you Dr. Arthur Cummins. Thank you, Dr. Little, for inviting me to uh, share this message around vulnerability assessment as it pertains to guidelines for educational facilities. Uh, in the next few minutes, what I hope to be able to provide uh, for you is um, evidence-based information as it relates to matters of safety and security uh, in and around both K-12 public education sites as well as institutions of higher education in this area of vulnerability assessment. We'll hope to uh, define that for you, uh, share some examples, uh, take you through some interactive activities, as well as provide resources and tools to support you at the local level in um, considering uh, and implementing these vulnerability assessments to assure safety and security uh, in and around our places of education. So with that as, as an introduction, we'll move uh, right into uh, the, the PowerPoint. Uh, I'll, I'll use PowerPoint as a, a primary way to deliver uh, content, uh, but again, there's opportunities uh, to engage uh, in this particular pre uh, presentation by virtue of some activities that will help hone your skills in this area of uh, vulnerability assessment. So here again is the outline and where uh, I hope to take you and, and navigate through uh, the content. Uh, certainly definition, <laughs> big picture about emergency management planning and how vulnerability assessments fit into that. Um, certainly we're going to talk about prevention and mitigation that's primarily where uh, the vulnerability assessment, hazard analysis, risk uh, assessment falls. We're going to talk specifically and perhaps a little in depth about SEPTED. That particular acronym stands for crime, excuse me, crime uh, prevention through environmental design. Uh, so we'll look specifically at some uh, um, features of, of that particular application. We'll look at how you take uh, this information and content and tools and begin the process uh, of putting together a team that can really look at these issues of uh, uh, vulnerability in and around our, our campus. And then uh, again, I want to leave you with some tools to support your implementation and some resources that again support uh, the process. So let's move right into uh, the, the content here as it relates to vulnerability assessment. In my initial research in this area, uh, just recently, in fact, in preparation for this uh, webinar, uh, looked into uh, Google and just put in vulnerability assessment. And uh, you should be aware that 3.2 million 
items surfaced in that original Google search. And I think part of that is related to certainly the evolving science of vulnerability assessment as it relates to safety and security, but also uh, it's a very broad terminology, and I'll try to refine that for uh, this uh, webinar audience as well. But in essence, it's the ongoing process of identifying and prioritizing risks to individual schools and school districts. I think it really is about prioritizing. This is a key feature of being able to know what might a school or campus consider doing first in this process of securing our campuses. It's also about selecting an assessment tool. There are many tools to choose from, uh, and the tool really depends on what is identified as a priority uh, by those that uh, are launching into uh, this investigation. <coughs> So definitions, I indicated that vulnerability assessment is oftentimes, uh, oftentimes uh, used invariably with these other titles or associated with these other kinds of assessments. So that is to say vulnerability assessments are also known as needs assessments, hazard analysis, safety audits, risk analysis, threat assessment, or consequent assessments. Now if you ask different uh, professionals in the field, they'll have different, di very different and specific definitions for really yeah, for each one of these as it relates to how they apply it to different audiences, to different uh, uh, structures and buildings and events. And I think that's uh, therein why you get 3.2 million hits when you put in vulnerability assessment into a search engine because it really encompasses all of these very specific kinds of investigations to identify priorities and needs. The source at the bottom of this slide is one of the, I think, most valuable resources available to anyone launching into uh, this area. It is a guide to school vulnerability assessments, key principles for safe schools, uh, published by the U.S. Department of Education Office of Safe and Drug Free School. It's a publication date of 2008, so in terms of its relevancy, it's one of the most comprehensive, easy to follow, systematic uh, approaches to uh, um, this process of investigating uh, risk and hazards around a the campus. These are the 10 items that are listed in a, a checklist. As you kind of look at these, uh, it gives you a sense of uh, the comprehensive approach that is suggested through research uh, for this process. I think uh, one of the things to consider as a key phrase here is in all emergency management, this idea of an all hazards approach really means that <laughs> schools must consider all the things that may happen that may disrupt a school campus, from worst case scenario to some of the day-to-day -day features that may just disrupt the process of teaching and learning, uh, and to keep that in consideration when they're trying to prioritize for them in their local jurisdiction what might be the greatest uh, hazard or probability of a hazard. I think also, you know, we talked about selecting the right assessment tool, and I'll have a chance to share a couple of those with you and lead you to some other resources. I believe also it's also key to report those findings. So you do this investigation, you uh, have these findings, sharing those findings and reaching out to those in the community that can support the action or implementation is key, and I want to emphasize that as well. And as always in any process, uh, research and, and, and design, certainly reviewing findings uh, and revising uh, on a regular basis, and I'll speak more to what that frequency might look like. I mentioned to you that <clears throat> vulnerability assessment really falls in this area of prevention and mitigation, which is one of the four phases of emergency management. Um, it really is in this area because you're assessing to prevent and or to mitigate uh, what might happen in and around your uh, school or school community. Uh, and it really is a, a significant component of these four phases. So let's look a little bit further at those four phases. In any approach, big picture, to emergency management, uh, any agency should consider these four very specific areas of emergency management. Today's conversation is around prevention mitigation, uh, but also another phase is preparedness, that which we do to prepare ourselves, our staff, uh, our students, our constituents for a, a pending event. Uh, 
The response phase is uh, what we most commonly refer to as the action. Uh, what will people do if the event happens? Uh, and what training is put into and emphasized so that people will know how to respond to a particular event. And then, of course, recovery. We know that recovery is an important feature of the four phases of emergency management. Perhaps it's the longest phase of emergency management because it deals with not only the the structural and financial recovery from an event, but also the emotional and psychological recovery to the individuals in the institution or at the school who may be impacted uh, by the event. The suggestion in research is simply this. If we do a good job in the mitigation prevention phase, in the preparedness phase, in the response phase, then the recovery phase uh, will be affected in this way. If people know that they have prepared well, they know what to do when they respond, then their recovery will happen at a faster rate with healthier results. And I believe that is key. In essence, what the research suggests is that if people have been active in their planning, their preparedness, their response, then they become responders in the recovery phase and not victims. And I believe that's a key feature in the big picture of emergency management. So learning objectives for the prevention mitigation as it relates to vulnerability ass uh, assessment are, are these here. And really uh, what I hope to move you to is this level of comfort and confidence in conducting a vulnerability assessment uh, at your local school site. So what is the goal? <clears throat> the goal is really big picture to ensure a safe and healthy learning environment. It really is to be very specific, perhaps scientific in your approach to uh, be able to state with confidence Yes, we can ensure a safe and healthy learning environment because we are taking these very specific steps in order to uh, be able to evidence that. So consider for a moment, if you will, what types of prevention activities are currently going on in your district or in your school. Uh, my hunch is that you have a lot of prevention that are happening, whether it's programmatic, whether it's from facilities, whether it's from the emergency management side. Uh, certainly we are doing things. The question becomes, um, what are we doing now? And what might we do next to continue to move our organization along a trajectory of sophistication uh, to support not only our learning, but again, that issue of safety and security. So here are some examples here of things that may already be uh, ongoing uh, within your local school's jurisdiction. Take a look at those. Again, I suspect that uh, there are many of these activities that uh, are happening. Some new and emerging kinds of practices uh, are really around this area of building access. Uh, some schools uh, are on a greater um, learning curve here as it relates to events that have, that have happened or incidents that they're experiencing. We'll talk specifically about that. This issue of food preparation and mail handling are relatively new features that we've uh, been made to respond to because of things that are occurring to us uh, uh, you know, in the real world as it relates to um, uh, you know, contaminated food and or uh, substances being mailed that certainly can be harmful. And so those are some of the emerging kinds of things that uh, <laughs> They want to so how people feel safe, whether it's the students, staff, or both, and certainly the, the perception of parents as it relates to the school environment and them as parents wanting to make sure that the adults at that school or on that campus are providing that safe and nurturing environment. So uh, don't overlook that maintaining positive school relationships, having adults that, that kids can go to to share information and to confide in is an important feature of this process of vulnerability assessments. So let's move from prevention to mitigation. Uh, what are some examples you might think of as it relates to mitigation? That is, what are things that um, you can do that you are doing to diminish the impact should the worst case scenario or an event happen? You see them depicted in the picture here is not uncommon from uh, earthquake, earthquake settings. This is actually a school library in California uh, uh, some time ago. Uh, but certainly the uh, things that one might consider looking at this picture, hey, we might have done this to prevent or mitigate uh, this kind of damage. 
So some examples, the physical plant, the footprint, the footprint of the school, the buildings, those kinds of things. And as you look at this list here, there are certainly things uh, that uh, we can do, be very, very active around uh, in this approach to, to mitigate uh, the impact of events. Again, applying this, um, uh, this, this process of uh, crime prevention through environmental design is something that we'll speak more to in depth. Uh, but it bears uh, bringing to the conversation here because it is a key feature being uh, recognized across the country as it relates to um, new development construction as well as uh, uh, modernization projects. And these are some of those principles, but again, I'm going to move forward uh, so that um, uh, we can uh, touch on that later. Throughout this uh, presentation, I want to be able to show pictures and offer some thinking and invite you into that thinking as it relates to uh, some examples. So when you think about crime prevention through environmental design and just it, it depicted in these pictures, there's some features that, again, you may or may not have uh, currently in um, your practice but are certainly recommended. Many schools, agencies, uh, campuses uh, have moved to some kind of check-in process where we're asking anybody that visits uh, administrative offices, classrooms, other facilities, that there's some kind of check-in or access um, uh, procedure. In this case, a sign-in sheet, perhaps some kind of uh, visitor's badge to identify that uh, you're not perhaps one of the staff, that you're a member of the public or somebody visiting the school. It appears that there are some kind of uh, instructions or directions here as well for, for visitors. And again, certainly still uh, uh, welcoming kinds of features uh, as it relates to uh, you know, coming into a school environment to say, hey, you're, you're welcome here, but we want you to, to adhere to these processes. Same here, uh, clear signage so that when people uh, come onto a campus, they know exactly where to go or are directed where to go through the use of signage, the use of landscaping as well. And then again, considerations such as this. This appears to be perhaps a K-3 or primary grade playground uh, and a fence that uh, creates a boundary that certainly keeps those that um, we want to keep out, out, <clears throat> and those that we want to keep in, uh, the children certainly in, uh, behind the fencing. Uh, what question that one might pose here is, is this particular fence high enough to really uh, create the barrier that's intended to keep the children in and keep them safe and keep uh, those who intend to do harm um, out? And so that's one of those questions that comes into play uh, when you think about SEPTED principles. Other examples here, psycho, emotional, and uh, physical. <clears throat> Certainly we learned a lot uh, during the um, H1N1 about hand washing and masks. I think uh, many schools need to put into to play some protocols as it relates to uh, pandemic kinds of events or, or at least the threat of pandemic. Um, and certainly those uh, things that we learn about uh, diet that can be uh, harmful to uh, uh, both uh, students and adults uh, that we need to be attentive to. So some key components of prevention mitigation. I'm going to say this as uh, simply as this. You have resources available to you that you can reach out to to support you in these processes. When you go through this vulnerability assessment, you can identify here's what came up for us in terms of priority. At that point, I would encourage you to reach out to collaborate with resources in the community uh, to continue to assess and analyze and ultimately act. Act on the findings that, uh, that have come to bear. So who? Who are those resources that, uh, that can support you in this way? As you look at this list, certainly some uh, come to mind right away as it relates to issues of safety and security, emergency procedures, your local law enforcement, uh, fire service personnel, public health, local businesses in terms of partners or partners in the process, and certainly reaching out and posing uh, questions or soliciting information from parents, students, teachers about their perception of what the uh, immediate threats may be uh, to them. I think it's an important uh, data piece. <clears throat> so previous and current assessments. Uh, you can reach out and get everything from crime statistics from your local law enforcement agency uh, to facility assessments coming from perhaps facility people or outside architectural uh, folks who intend to support or, or help. Uh, again, the school culture and climate assessments uh, and after action reports from, uh, from emergency situations, never losing an opportunity to learn from events that uh, are actual, that, happening, that, that are happening, that we uh, respond to, uh, but learning from each of those is, is a key opportunity, I think, as well. As it relates to safety and security uh, needs assessment and understanding the environment, we're back to that. As you recall, I, I pointed out this uh, this language is all hazards or all risk approach is to consider 
what might happen, <clears throat> how might it affect us, how uh, much of an impact would that be, uh, and what can we do to, to mitigate that. So to, to kind of illustrate that, I want to take you to this, this graphic. This graphic really represents uh, this approach to school-based, district-wide, neighborhood, and greater community. When you look at this, <clears throat> you clearly can see the outline here, the footprint, what appears to be uh, a high school and perhaps a middle school or elementary school um, that are adjacent to one another. covers a large area. <clears throat> Considerations from this vulnerability assessment begin in this way. What are the things that might happen that you can see from this overhead uh, aerial um, Google photo to immediately become uh, aware of and then perhaps concerned about um, in worst case scenario? A couple of things that are evident. You have these two primary thoroughfares here. Uh, knowing what's going across in terms of transportation, those roads, chemicals, uh, um, uh, cargo, those things that could be harmful uh, may be useful in your planning. When you look at how you may access this uh, particular school, you notice that there are uh, very specific uh, um, directional things perhaps that you might want to illuminate uh, or restrict depending upon um, how you want the flow of traffic to come in and out of this particular school. So using these kinds of photos supports big picture what are things that we're currently not considering that we might consider that could impact the business of the day as it relates to uh, a K-12 uh, institution or institutional higher ed? Now let's back away from that. <clears throat> Here's even a larger perspective. Here you see <clears throat> there's a school. Again, there's a thoroughfare going by the school that uh, may be cause for concern. But perhaps in long-term planning, uh, the consideration is really this airport facility here. Um, in the event that uh, something unfolds there, a terrorist event, uh, a plane crash, uh, the threat of a plane uh, crash, that may impact uh, the business of the day for this particular school. And being able to reach out and plan uh, with folks here and gain from their expertise and put together uh, those kinds of um, protocols would be an important feature. And really what we're trying to move uh, each of our educational institutions towards is, is that kind of broad thinking. So what can happen? Well, here's a list here of a lot of different things that can happen uh, in, in a, lot of different, uh, a lot of different ways. I think the natural disasters that we have across the country certainly vary, and I would say that for both uh, K-12 and higher ed institutions, we do a pretty good job of preparing our uh, student populations and constituents for those regional natural hazards. In, earth, in California, we do earthquake really well. In the Midwest, uh, tornadoes, they do really well, and certainly in the southern uh, part of the United States and, and the Gulf Coast, uh, they do hurricanes really well. The question is, what are other things that might happen with what frequency and with what probability are we not currently uh, preparing for that we should? <clears throat> so here's some of the profiles of those hazards to consider. And I mentioned some of these in, in the in the last uh, on the last slide, but the frequency of occurrence, if it happened, the magnitude, the location, uh, that it might happen, and what, uh, what features of that may uh, impact that feature or create a cascading event, the duration, the seasonal pattern. These are things that, uh, that we can think about and prepare for. In fact, here's one of the tools uh, that can support in that very specific way. This is known as a risk matrix, uh, risk matrix uh, or an index worksheet. And you see here, it's, it allows people to systematically and methodically uh, with the support of teams and agencies to come together to ask questions uh, like, what is the uh, likelihood of a tornado? Well, if I'm in Tornado o uh, Alley, someplace like Oklahoma, Kansas, Texas, uh, it's certainly going to be highly likely. If it happened, what would the magnitude be? Well, it could certainly be, whether it's an F1 or an F5, it could be along any contingency here, but certainly critical and catastrophic comes to mind as we do planning for the safety of uh, in K-12 schools. What kind of warning do you get? Well, although we're getting more and more sophisticated with tornado warnings, you still really get minimal. You get some, but you get minimal. And again, if it were to happen over the worst case scenario, certainly along that range. And so you, you add or you assign a risk or priority. And for Tornado Alley, I would suggest it's going to be a high probability that could happen. So that may become one of the highest priority features that you begin to plan around. If your protocol is already practiced and you're efficient and effective and confident that you can do the things that are necessary to protect life and property for a tornado, then perhaps you look at other kinds of events adding using the same kind of application of this risk index 
uh, to support your planning to identify whether this feature may be high, medium, or low for many events. And so that's just one of the tools that can be simply but systematically applied to your planning and your thinking. A distinction. Vulnerability is defined as the susceptibility of life, property, or environment. <clears throat> that is, uh, the key term there, I think, is the susceptibility. Um, as opposed to risk, risk is really the probability of suffering loss or injury from the impact of the hazard. So it's that risk that you're really trying to assign and that probability that you're trying to identify uh, so that you can prevent and mitigate against uh, to protect the vulnerability and the susceptibility of life. It's a subtle difference, but I think it bears uh, noting uh, noting here. <clears throat> so as it relates to um, the action part, with any uh, learning element, especially for the purposes of this webinar that will be posted uh, on the ACF website, uh, it, it's, it's to act. It's to move you uh, to get more information, to give you tools for you to consider at the local jurisdiction and to act upon uh, your, new, your new learning and to reach out to those that can support. Uh, but certainly, uh, partners uh, in your community that can uh, support the process, assign and determine responsibility, and then implement the necessary changes is really the, the outcome. So let's do a quick interactive activity, take you through some of these uh, simple but necessary kinds of uh, um, uh, SEPTED principles, as well as good vulnerability assessment. <clears throat> a note here, there's a rule in SEPTED that suggests three by three. And that is to say, when it comes to bushes, shrubberies, trees, things in and around facilities, they should be three feet away from the wall and three feet above or below windows. That is to say, so there's a, a line of sight. So as it relates to this particular case, recommendation would be that these um, are too tall, uh, perhaps too uh, unkept. Um, and uh, as we know, this is where uh, things seem to appear, whether it's uh, uh, contraband, narcotics, drugs, weapons. Uh, this is a place that uh, they could be uh, stored, hidden, thrown, those kinds of things, so to limit those kinds of issues. Here, I think this uh, is trying to point out a couple of things. We're doing better with the trees and shrubs there as it relates to visibility, to see and be seen. But as it relates to this bike rack, it appears that perhaps some of these bikes are, are not locked, perhaps availing themselves for, uh, for theft. Um, and it's just a, a concern and a consideration that uh, can be problematic for a school administrator or law enforcement. Uh, these things go missing, and there's an impact on an administrator's time to try to solve that uh, crime. <clears throat> Again, in this picture, it really is about location of this building. If this location of this building is in a high uh, hurricane area or zone, then we would suggest that this glass uh, must be uh, shatterproof or reinforced or in some way not become a hazard for those outside or inside the building uh, due to, to high winds. And so as it relates to construction regionally, that's a consideration. An example from uh, uh, our partners in Seattle, Washington. In Washington, apparently, uh, they don't like to cut down trees. And so uh, in lieu of cutting down trees that are in violation of that three and three, they've actually greased this tree. I don't recall what the substance was but to uh, basically make it uh, too slick to climb to access uh, this roof here. And so innovation sometimes prevails. Uh, another picture I think it is inherent with uh, some hazards or risk here. This is a middle school, uh, uh, an unprotected uh, uh, ladder here that certainly could uh, be seen as a, a, a toy to younger youth. And then, of course, these unprotected, unlocked uh, fire alarms that certainly uh, posed a consideration or a concern. This is really two pictures here. Uh, one is depicting um, uh, this is depicting a uh, uh, elevator system for uh, wheelchair bound or uh, disabled youth uh, consideration for multi-story buildings and this is uh, a carry so an emergency situation stored in a stairway so that those who may be uh, uh, incapacitated or immobile uh, can be placed in this uh, chair and transported down a flight of stairs. This picture depicts uh, ingress and egress. Uh, again, a couple of things here to note. I think that uh, this picture depicts maybe a meter greeter, which is great. Welcome to our school. Uh, but deliveries during the morning or afternoon hour by a vendor is probably not a good time, or at least not a good time to do that in the very front of school there. A great example here. I believe this is in uh, San Marcos in, in San Diego County, California. Uh, it's clearly defined here. You're going to go in one way out the other. You're going to be asked to stop and show an ID. You have a manned kiosk to check uh, uh, IDs or maybe it's a meter greeter. 
but certainly an opportunity to really uh, um, identify where you want traffic to go and how and, and uh, there's somebody there to, to greet them in some way. Signage is a key uh, um, piece of uh, directing people when they come on. Uh, Number two, this brick could then be used perhaps for gaining entry if they want to throw it through a window, whether it's a classroom window or through this particular door. Uh, so probably, again, an example of not the best practice. It's fantastic to show off uh, um, uh, certainly uh, awards and accomplishments of, uh, of student uh, programs, athletics, music, drama, those kinds of things. The, the consideration here is, is this glass tempered in some way, shatterproof, and, and uh, doesn't, would not pose a, a threat uh, in the event of uh, uh, an earthquake, perhaps, or other event. Certainly the signage in this bathroom is, uh, is the feature to be uh, depicted here. Uh, lots of good information about washing your hands, probably other messages from public health about uh, things that we can do on a daily basis to, to maintain our own um, individual health as well as general public health. <clears throat> In a shop class, perhaps, all the uh, indicators and, and notations of uh, equipment in play, uh, distance away from those pieces of equipment, uh, safety equipment could be worn, and certainly a, a list of procedures to be followed to ensure the, the most safety. In many uh, areas, uh, folks will recognize these. These are intended to uh, keep uh, skateboarders from grinding on landscaping features that uh, may begin to erode the, the, the concrete edges here. Uh, they now make them in all kinds of decorated uh, kinds of uh, uh, here to, to get, make them more uh, appealing and, and less uh, uh, still have the same effect, but a little bit more appealing to the eye. A uh, story is told here from a friend of mine in uh, Kentucky. Uh, this pictures, uh, these girls showed uh, uh, this picture to a local television station to suggest that this is the environment that they have to walk to school in each day, and as a result, uh, um, there was uh, funding provided to put a sidewalk here and some safety barriers so students would have safe uh, ingress and egress uh, to school. And of course, an example here of what we'd all like, uh, all of our institutions uh, to feel like and look like. And, and um, as you see here, Robert B. Turner Elementary School uh, appears to have these pillars of, um, of character. And uh, it's a bright room and uh, great colors. And, and the, the reality is, is not all of our schools can look like that. Some are built in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and we adopt what we adopt. But the question becomes, what can we do to move uh, our schools into these welcoming places that feel safe and secure uh, through a very systematic uh, process of vulnerability assessment? So some questions that we get uh, um, when doing these kinds of presentations uh, really sound uh, like this. Um, what are your thoughts on parent, staff, and student pre and post surveys on uh, their knowledge regarding uh, general crisis procedures? Uh, the suggestion and recommendation from across the field is absolutely, absolutely. When you're considering a vulnerability assessment, reach out to the stakeholders who, who live there. That is to say, the adults who work there, the students who attend school every day, the parents uh, who hold uh, you know, schools responsible for the safety and security. Uh, reach out to them, uh, gain their perspective uh, through uh, surveys, uh, perception surveys, focus groups. Uh, allow them to help identify what they feel are the, the uh, priorities uh, for them, I think, is a key feature. Uh, another question, is vulnerability assessment process take into account events that occur at schools uh, uh, like uh, school board meetings, award programs, sporting events? Absolutely. I think one of the features of sophistication that I've seen in the last year has been uh, moving beyond just the school uh, building itself uh, to the district office, to securing uh, board meetings, to having conversations about uh, volatile personnel who may attend a board meeting and how to secure for that or screen for that. Uh, certainly sporting events, uh, when you have rival schools coming together, what planning and features of vulnerability assessment can you overlay when you're doing planning for a sporting event that may again prevent and or mitigate uh, the, effect, the effects of uh, volatile um, members within a, a crowd that could create problems. And finally, what are good ways to integrate the importance of safety and security without compromising the priority of academics? And I, this is what I say to that. <clears throat> the suggestion is, is that uh, in most mission statements that I see, vision statements uh, that are created by educational institutions, both K-12 and higher ed, there's something that says, that says has these two features. Number one, 
uh, great academics, uh, great academic uh, uh, rigor, um, opportunities for students to achieve. Also in those vision and mission statements, something about safe, secure, caring climate. Those are two features that I see in uh, vision and mission statements across the country. So why not? Why not put priority, as much priority, on the issues of safety and security as we do about academic rigor? Um, and so that's an argument that I would make of uh, emergency management uh, to put as much emphasis on this issue of safety and security because we know that if people don't feel safe and secure, they cannot perform uh, at their highest level. So with that, I want to go just a little bit deeper here uh, on this uh, uh, process of uh, SEPTED, again, Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. Been around for a while. <coughs> it uh, uh, definitely um, uh, has uh, uh, roots going back to 1971 and it really it comes from the um, architectural side. So the question being what can we do as we construct school buildings, public buildings, uh, that may somehow mitigate, reduce, or prevent features of crime or disruption. So as it relates to a definition, here is uh, some of the language that I can offer with you. But it really is about uh, building an environment that can re uh, lead to a reduction in the fear of crime or the incidence of crime in any given, again, public building. Uh, here it speaks to uh, um, uh, you know, community problems and for prevention in new and revised construction and land use plans. I think that's key. It's the construction part, but also the use of signage and landscaping to move people in the areas that we want them to go and restrict them from areas we don't want them to go with a very intentional uh, uh, process. <clears throat> it is about the creation of space and its use and its intended use. It is about the position of buildings and the consideration during construction or for new construction. It's about interior and exterior designs. And, and again, it's uh, how the users will use the space, how we can influence that through specific design. In schools, it is to reduce criminal incidents and disorderly behavior. I think this disorderly behavior is uh, really what an administrator's language might be as it relates to if I can do things with my facility to reduce disorderly behavior, I, I want to know more about that and, and want to investigate that further. Um, and again, it's about that safe school uh, culture and climate and create that sense uh, through a very specific planning uh, and design of our, our campuses. So what about the crime risks in schools? Um, building layout produces blind spots. When you think about uh, portable or modular buildings that are brought in to support rising student populations, or if you're a declining student population, the empty building that's there. Uh, making sure that uh, you keep into consideration does that create a spot where students may gather uh, maybe a physical hazard or they may be engaging in behaviors that you don't want them to be engaged in. Bus loading and unloading and traffic ingress and egress. I cannot say enough about uh, how each year in the state of California, seven <coughs> students, one year, 2006, Orange County, California, killed in and around schools during uh, uh, beginning of school, end of school. And when I think about all the things that we do with red curbs, yellow curbs, stripes in the street, uh, uh, reduced speed limits, uh, patrols, adult supervision, ingress and egress of traffic is a key consideration for all schools uh, to consider in this process. So this SEPTED principle gives you a little bit more detail as it relates to the features. There's this natural surveillance, there's, that's the see and be seen. Access management, that's people coming in and out of the facility. This issue of territoriality, how do you keep those out that you want out and in that you want in. The physical maintenance and upkeep, I think that is uh, certainly the effort of every uh, facilities coordinator. Uh, order and maintenance and, and then activity support, what we'll talk about just briefly. So natural surveillance, the idea is to see and be seen. And so the placement uh, and design of windows and hallways and office space uh, is really about um, the ability for uh, uh, people to see one another without obstruction. Now, certainly there are, there are times when uh, barriers may be needed to, to uh, restrict that visibility. Uh, but in sense of an open space uh, uh, under the concept of SEPTED, it's a see and be seen uh, approach. Um, so an example here in this, in this particular picture. Um, as you look at this house, older construction it appears, 
one of the things that comes to mind is uh, there's really no uh, sidewalk that would indicate how you might approach uh, this porch landing. And then because there are a couple of doors here, it's really unclear which door might be the front door or a door of interest. So if uh, entrance, so if I'm wanting to enter this house, this property, this business, there are no real indicators to suggest to me where I should go, uh, which door I should approach uh, for um, example of how through landscaping, uh, um, walkways, uh, signage, um, you can lead the public to where you want them to go uh, so that there's a comfort for them and no guessing and intention by planning uh, that people will get where you want them to be for, for check-in perhaps. Uh, a positive example of that perhaps, you see here uh, a fence barrier. This is the street and or sidewalk or garden and the other side of that uh, fence is definitely uh, inside this person's private property yard. Um, Although it's an upstairs landing, it appears that uh, you go right up these steps to this door to enter. It's really the only entrance that you see, and so it becomes apparent to someone who is new to enter this house or this facility uh, that this is uh, the way to the front door or check-in. Here's a school. Here's a good example to see and be seen. A lot of ambient light comes in. People can see out to see traffic, what's going on out here. People typically can see in, certainly the glare of the sun, tippered windows, those kinds of things. But a good example of the see and be seen principle. So we get to a little bit more sophisticated kinds of features that are uh, maybe part of more of new construction or retrofitted for older construction, but certainly a, a camera here for video surveillance so that this particular parking lot can be seen, or at least the area out here, you see a fence here uh, that's protecting uh, perhaps a material that are inside. <clears throat> more video surveillance, again, this appears to be newer construction. Uh, you notice that uh, this appears to be... Um, uh, restroom facilities, so certainly uh, any students traveling in or out of this restroom facility may be captured here. That may be an important feature on, with an investigation, uh, um, as we know that some things happen in bathrooms that, uh, that we don't uh, intend to happen. Uh, again, same school, different perspective, lunch table area. Now, again, you know, new construction offers you know, uh, appealing to the eye. Uh, the gymnasium is clearly labeled. You have these beautiful umbrellas. It's a, an inviting, pleasing place uh, for students and staff uh, to gather. And this added security of having video surveillance uh, certainly brings a sense that um, um, uh, there's a, a feature of consideration as it relates to supervision. So the feature of access management. It really is about denying access to crime targets and creating a perception of risk for offenders. So if I want to come into the school, and I can just walk on the campus and not be challenged by anybody, that's a consideration. And so these features of access management become uh, primarily important. And again, I would say that as I uh, work with schools locally and across the country, many schools, public schools as well as uh, uh, um, uh, private schools and, and we see in our governmental buildings, and that is very specific uh, sign-in, check-in, uh, some kind of badge, laminate uh, around the neck to identify, hey, I'm a visitor here uh, today, as well as the teaching that if you're a staff member or an employee at one of these locations, to, uh, to be able to challenge those who you don't see uh, that have that identifying lanyard and direct them politely uh, to the front office or to the access area uh, to be recognized and such. Uh, again, some features here that uh, both are, are school friendly to suggest this is the way into school or perhaps the way out of school. Also a nice indicator in a childlike way, hey, there may be students present, so keep your speed down. Uh, although I don't want to see a, a speed uh, limit sign or indicator here, certainly the thought that this may just be the thing that is visible enough to keep drivers uh, uh, safe and speeds down that particular area. So signage, as simple as this look, it certainly gives direction. Hey, this is the way out, and this is the way to business, math, and science. Issues of territoriality, the use and art, and I love that sign. I love that, uh, that terminology. The use of art, signage, landscaping and fencing and pavement uh, treatments to move people in the way that you want them to, to move and to delineate places uh, where you want them to be and not be. So and a residential example of that might be, um, here is certainly the public sidewalk. This homeowner has uh, chosen to put a, a small short shrub around, shrub around his yard, clearly defining this is my yard, that's the public sidewalk, that's my preferences for you to stay uh, outside of uh, that boundary. Another example. 
Um, artwork. <clears throat> research is shown, <clears throat> and this is contested often, but research is shown that campuses should provide opportunities for this kind of art to be displayed, whether it's student or commercial. Uh, it does a couple of things. Certainly has an influence on the culture and climate. In this particular case, you know, home of the knights, uh, the round table certainly brings that sense of belonging, a sense of uh, who the school is, uh, and it's cleverly blended here uh, in the interior of a school. These are lockers, and as you can see here, here's a lock. And if you look closely, you can also see each of the locker handles here. The research would suggest that doing this reduces the uh, frequency of uh, or diminishes uh, the frequency of uh, graffiti. Now, that's not going to work for all communities all the time, um, but the, the research is suggesting that uh, by virtue of these kinds of art projects being displayed to support uh, many features of school climbing culture, also a reduction in the incidence of graffiti. Another example of that would be here, again, bringing that sense of belonging for school students, but also uh, certainly pleasing uh, to the eye and uh, uh, reduction in, this, in the sense of graffiti. Uh, a speed or traffic calming measure, you see here as you uh, enter or exit the school, you have to go around this uh, kind of roundabout. Again, the, is, the idea is to slow traffic down as they enter a school area. Certainly other kinds of uh, uh, speed calming or traffic calming measures that uh, are easily adapted into uh, school settings uh, in front of uh, schools uh, for ingress and egress. Again, back to San Marcos High School, take a closer look here. Certainly want people to go in and out here, perhaps a delivery truck leaving at this time. Must show ID. If you get in closer here, it shows specifically you've got a live person in this kiosk. They must show a student identification or some identification as to, to why they're there, certainly giving a visual for uh, a live person there to, to greet them uh, for all the reasons we've mentioned uh, previously. Things that are ongoing, I know, in every uh, educational institution, sort of the issue of physical maintenance and maintaining uh, clean, safe, secure um, uh, building facilities. Uh, but just a reinforcement of the idea that that needs to be uh, timely and replacement of vandalized, worn, or damaged features need to be uh, repaired as quickly as possible. Um, I think that uh, our schools do a great job of moving in that direction as quickly as they can with the resources that they have. So here's an example of you know, maybe an older construction bathroom that uh, the school has taken the time to, uh, uh, to paint and add some, uh, some accents here just to make it uh, feel uh, much more comfortable and, and aesthetically pleasing to the eye. Same for the, the boys' restroom, and the suggestion is that would uh, really um, reduce the amount of uh, graffiti writing on the walls, those kinds of things as you continue to build in the sense of school pride as a, an order of education for, uh, for student populations as well. Order maintenance, it is clearly defined uh, and to communicate rules of conduct, illegal acts, and undesirable behavior. So I can't think of any administrator at K-12 that doesn't want to uh, effectively communicate uh, expectations of behavior uh, on a school campus. So it's as simple as chart paper that uh, indicates the behaviors they want to see in the I will positive uh, um, context. Um, I really, really uh, like that way, so that students understand what their role and responsibility is, and um, can can uh, you know certainly share with other students. Many schools across the country, and in particular here in California, we have these mandatory signs that must be posted uh, on school entrances as it relates to uh, a tobacco-free uh, zone. And then you know, there was a question earlier about this activity support. Uh, so parent volunteer programs to monitor the campus. We have campus supervisors, uh, recess ladies, lunch ladies, these auxiliary people that come in and provide an incredible resource of adult supervision throughout the course uh, of the day uh, during recess and lunchtime and those kind of things. And don't forget the teachers. You know, keeping a teacher's morale high is certainly a... Uh, uh, this was sent in by a partner in Canada who shows a pool table being put into the teacher's lounge, and, and why not uh, at lunchtime or on some downtime uh, engage in a friendly game of pool. Um, I know that other districts have put in ping pong tables uh, just to bring a sense of uh, uh, morale to, uh, to schools and support that, that sense of needs for the adult staff. Target hardening, much more a, a feature of, I think, um, you know, this, this uh, terrorism and, and terrorist, terrorized proofing schools, but certainly uh, features of consideration, sometimes cost, but certainly uh, the ability to consider 
deadbolt, interior hinges, the way doors open and close. Some more hardware features. I think, again, looks like a little bit newer construction. Uh, certainly a solid chain anchoring to an anchor here into the concrete uh, to keep this table from moving around on the weekends or after school. Same with the benches, securely mounted in the floor. The, uh, the, the grinder uh, defeating uh, mechanisms on the bench. And as you see up here, too, uh, some signage to suggest here's what we want you to know about uh, our school in this particular community. Um, this picture we've seen before, so I'll, I'll move past that. Um, and some, some really some implementation tips. As you put together your vulnerability assessment team, um, I would really encourage you to, again to do outreach to local law enforcement and fire as two of the first two agencies you invite uh, on your team. They're going to see things from a filter that perhaps educators are not trained from. That is to say, they're going to look at things a little bit differently as it relates to safety and security uh, and fire safety than perhaps the trained eye of a school administrator or facilities uh, director. So um, as you begin to put together your team and thinking in this area, uh, that's a strong recommendation that, that I would offer. So a couple more questions uh, that we often get to in, this, uh, um, in this series and in the, before I close. Uh, question, is there a growing awareness and concern about improving building access controls in our school buildings and what are the current trends? Here's what, what are the current trends. Signage to get people into the front office. A sign in or a log sheet that indicates um, uh, name and reason for a visit or person that they're looking to, to speak with. Some kind of identifier, whether it's a sticker, whether it's a laminate. Uh, I've seen pins, I've seen hats, I've seen uh, vests, uh, things that would be a visual indicator that they are there visiting uh, for the day. More sophisticated kinds of trends that I see are actually um, uh, scanners that can scan a driver's license. Um, now these become controversial in some essences, but uh, scanning a driver's license, uh, the, the information becomes what information is on there that the school is requesting, but it's a way to keep a database of everybody who comes into the school building for a variety of reasons, uh, both uh, you know, uh, positive in terms of um, you know, knowing the school and being able to reach out to them, but also to screen for those that, that have ill will. Second question here is, uh, there appear to be many vulnerability assessment tools. How would you advise selecting the right tool? I'm going to show you a couple, and there will be more placed on, on the website, more placed on the website. And I would say this. When you consider what your highest priorities are and what actions you want to take, that will lead you to the tool uh, to be identified to support you in that way. There are many tools that support culture and climate, facilities, buildings, grounds, community, neighborhood. Uh, and those are very, very different tools that allow you to collect very different data. But to get you the data that you need to assess, to analyze, uh, and to identify, here is what we've identified as priority. Here are the resources we have uh, to support us in addressing this. Um, here's the data that we'll collect to let us know that we're being successful in our action. Uh, here's how we're going to communicate uh, our action and ultimately reassessing that on an annual basis. Um, so how that the tool you select depends upon uh, the vulnerabilities that you identify. That's probably the best way to say that. Here's a listing of some of those tools that I'll just briefly allude to. Uh, number one is the, uh, um, the U.S. Department of Education guide that I alluded to earlier. I'm going to show you quickly this one uh, on um, a student school safety audit out of the Illinois State Board of Education. I think it's fantastic as it relates to getting the perceptions of students. Also, uh, the Texas uh, School Safety Center has an outstanding campus safety and security uh, audit toolkit. Uh, also out of the Virginia Department of Education, a school safety audit uh, protocol. I'm going to show you briefly the K-12 security vulnerability checklist. It's a 369-item comprehensive uh, list that you may want to take a look at to guide your thinking and planning. And finally, um, Delaware Department of Education also has uh, a fantastic uh, school safety audit guideline. So with that, I just want to show you a, a couple of things uh, with uh, this one. Again, the resource is the Student Advisory Council for the Illinois State Board of Education. 
Here's the overview, <clears throat> and I really like these three uh, features that it lists here. Students are often the first and most aware of pending problems. Students are more likely to accept responsibility for school safety if they're involved, and students have the most at stake in keeping schools safe. I love that approach and the involvement of students to uh, collect the data. Um, here are uh, uh, the guidelines, and more importantly down here, the general instructions. They have these five forms, and I briefly just want to take a look at this. Uh, here's special instructions for use by the student audit teams. This is information for the students as they approach this task and you involve them. And, and here's what it is. It's the perceptions of safety conditions in the school and needs assessment reference. And it's really simple. Students feel safe at school. Yes, no, I don't know. And on down the list. Uh, item number eight. Crisis, <clears throat> emergency drills uh, occur regularly and are taken seriously by students and staff. Yes, no, I don't know. But that tool itself, I think, would yield some incredible data. Another one here. <clears throat> Perceptions of the extent of safety problems in this school. Then it goes down uh, very specific kinds of behaviors. Assaults, groups, gangs, drugs, weapons, threats. And again, the students have a chance to reply. No problem. Serious problem. I don't know. <clears throat> again, each of these documents has a very specific intent in, in regard to the data that you can solicit, again, from the student population. So I would point to this as one of those documents that's worthy of your review uh, to reach out to students who are the primary stakeholders to gain from them and their insight, I think, is, is an opportunity of uh, specificity to, to not miss. I'll show you one more before I close. This is the 369 item uh, survey that I spoke of. And so I'll, I'll bring that to your attention here. <clears throat> you'll see that this is a very simple checklist that may, uh, that will, in fact, uh, uh, provoke your thinking around the idea of uh, things to consider uh, around uh, vulnerabilities that pertain to students, staff, buildings, facilities, uh, um, outside um, uh, features and impacts, community, and you'll see so they're, they're, they're listed here. So everything from keys to money handling, mail handling, we talked about that earlier, off-premise uh, procedures, after-hour emergency procedures, and as you go down the list, just more and more and more the specificity that perhaps uh, you may lack or your team may lack in, in asking the right questions, this provides a very comprehensive listing. Uh, again, shelter in place, lockdown procedures, interior and exterior lighting, fencing, and all those kinds of things. Again, 369 opportunities to pique your thinking, your curiosity. Are, are we uh, being attentive to this? Are we uh, doing what we need to do uh, uh, to address the issues of, uh, again, you know, restrooms, stairways, computer rooms, server rooms, uh, again, uh, right, right down the list. So I'd point to that as two of the really kind of primary features uh, uh, for consideration uh, as you move forward in this process. <clears throat> I'm going to end here, and I want to, uh, I want to first of all uh, thank um, ASAF for the invitation to come in and share this message. Uh, please, please, please uh, go to their website and, and uh, utilize the resources they have there for vulnerability assessment and the m multiple other resources to support your learning, your growth in this area. Um, so with that, I will say uh, thank you very much, and I hope the information is useful to all, and I would encourage you uh, uh, to act on that which uh, um, has the most value to you. Thank you very much. ASEP would like to extend a very special thank you to Dr. Cummins and our participants for joining our webinar today. Please take a moment to complete the webinar evaluation. We value your opinion and look forward to hearing your feedback. Remember to visit our website at www.acefacilities.org and join us on your preferred social media outlet.